Live fire munitions training is essential for troops to maintain combat readiness and it is inevitable that contamination will occur on and around the military ranges where this takes place. Grantfield University is keen to understand more about both current and future contamination and questions they're asking about the chemical residues left on the ranges from fully, partially or undetonated munitions include What processes influence their movement through the environment? Where do they eventually end up? Do they have long-term effects on resources such as soil and water? What is the most effective method to establish where and to what level contamination has occurred? Traditional explosives such as TNT and RDX are well understood in terms of their effect on the environment. However, less is known about the impact of insensitive high explosives, otherwise known as IHEs, that are currently being brought into military service. Designed to minimise the risk of accidental detonation, it is essential that these are also understood and managed in order to mitigate contamination. Polymer bond explosives known as PBX are a type of IHE where the compounds contained within are encapsulated by a polymer binding. One of the projects I'm involved with is investigating the migration of RDX, a widely used explosive from PBX, into groundwater under different artificial climatic conditions. The seasonal climates of southwest England were simulated in a laboratory and samples of PBX were exposed to these conditions. Samples of rainfall runoff were collected every 24 hours and analysed to determine the percentage loss of RDX from the PBX. These preliminary studies showed that RDX does migrate from the polymer matrix in all weathers and that deposits of PBX on ranges are likely to result in RDX contamination in the environment by dissolution and transport in water. It was also found that whilst the polymer remained intact, the rate of RDX release is accelerated in warm temperatures with intense UV exposure. Long-term work is now underway to fully investigate the rate of RDX release from PBX in both artificial and real environments. Current research has mainly focused on investigating the environmental effect of individual constituents of IHE formulations. As Tracy's colleague explains, this may not be fully representative of real-world scenarios. The use of IHEs may result in multiple explosive residues being deposited together and on differing soil types depending on the location of the training range. We were interested in determining the effect of combined explosive constituents in different soil types. Would they interact and behave in a significantly different way to the individually tested constituents? The study we conducted investigated the effects of the combined IHE constituents, DNAN, NQ and NTO under controlled laboratory conditions. We used two UK soil types, loamy and sandy, the former being similar to the soil at two UK military training ranges and the latter commonly used as an absorbent for training activities such as bullet catching. Two types of experiments were conducted. First, small samples of soil were incubated with the explosive mixture for up to nine weeks so that full degradation profiles of the three explosives in varying soil types could be observed. Secondly, soil column experiments were conducted, which aimed to mimic the transport of contaminants, the explosives in this case, through the environment. The results we got supported work from literature on the individual constituents, suggesting that the three explosives in combination did not interact with each other in the soil types tested. This is significant when considering this type of IHE and its environmental impact, especially if adverse interactions due to soil conditions could generate more toxic and persistent contaminants. Both the static and soil column experiments confirm that soils with high organic content, like the loamy soil, are more likely to degrade DNAN and NTO. Our results show that when this type of IHE is used on training ranges, the most significant environmental impact may be from NTO. Even though NTO itself is not thought to be significantly toxic, it rapidly degrades in the environment into potentially toxic degradation products. DNAN is most likely to degrade in soils with high organic content, although into less toxic products. What happens to military training ranges when there is no longer a requirement for them? Usually they're sold for residential or other use, but because of their often long-term exposure to explosives and propellants, they need to be cleaned up first. For this to be effective, the levels of contamination first need to be established, and research undertaken at Cranfield has been investigating the validity of the different methods used to do this. When sampling for explosive contamination, one of three strategies is usually employed. Grab, an individual soil sample collected from a specific location at a particular time. A method best suited to small areas of contamination, it only represents a snapshot in time. Composite. Multiple soil increments taken at different locations within a defined sampling area. Could identify hotspots, but no true representation of the whole area. Multi-increment. 
also known as MI. Combination of up to 100 individual soil increments of the same geometry and mass taken from evenly distributed locations throughout the sampling area to form one representative sample. This process is repeated three times to obtain three 100 increments. The combination of all the soil increments increases the likelihood of identifying contamination whilst eliminating disparities in results that can occur when sampling individual or smaller areas. Until recently, the grab and composite methods were used for military sampling. MI was introduced as an additional method in 2018. Despite not identifying hotspots and only giving average contamination over the entire area, the benefits of reduced costs due to quicker sampling techniques and less analysis time and the ability to efficiently assess large areas for contamination make it the most suitable method for full site characterisation. In the same way that live fire training for troops is regarded as crucial, so too is the need for ongoing research to support the identification and management of explosive contamination. By continuing its work with both traditional and new generation explosives, Cranfield will carry on contributing towards managing the environmental effects of both these types of materials.